it is, it is undertaken in a COVID secure manner. Limited public seating has been made available. However, this meeting is also being webcast to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. Please be advised that the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. So for housekeeping, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble by Queen Victoria's statue in Guildhall Square. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust, Guildhall Trust's fire marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception decks should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. So the live streaming, may I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed. Everyone speaking via microphone will be on camera, include the, including those who make deputations. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please can everyone when you use the microphones remember to switch them off when you have finished. So we'll now go round and if we start with David at the back and we'll go round on the outside inwards. Morning everybody, David Williams, Chief Executive. Thank you. Good morning, Penny Emerit, Chief Exec, Portsmouth Hospitals. Kelly Nash, Strategy Unit of the City Council. Good morning, Matt Gummerson, Head of Strategic Intelligence and Research, Portsmouth City Council. Uh, Hayden Jones, Assistant Director for Children across the CCG and the Local Authority, representing the Director of Children's Services today. Uh, good morning, Councillor Susie Horton, Cabinet Member for Children, Families and Education. Good morning, Lisa Wills, Strategy and Partnership Manager in the Strategy Unit. Uh, Gerald Van Chancellor, Leader of the City Council here in Portsmouth. Terry Russell, uh, Deputising for Susanna Rosenberg, Solent uh, NHS Trust. Good morning, Diane Sherlock, CEO of Age UK Portsmouth and here representing the voluntary sector. Good morning, Jackie Powell, lay member for Portsmouth CCG. Good morning, Helen Atkinson, Director of Public Health for Portsmouth. Good morning, colleagues, Andy Biddle, uh, Director of Adult Social Care, Portsmouth City Council. Morning, Councillor Lewis Gosling, the Conservative representative on this board. Uh, morning everyone, Terry Norton and I'm here in the capacity of Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Matthew Willington, Cabinet Member for Health, Wellbeing and Social Care and Co-Chair of the, of, the, um, of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Roger Batterbury, Chairperson, Health Watch Portsmouth. Anna Martin, Democratic Services. Thank you very much. We've got some apologies for absence. So we've got Sarah Beatty and Jennifer Humphrey from the Probation Service, Sarah Daly from Children's Social Care, Professor Anita Franklin from the University of Portsmouth may um, join us but uh, may not be able to because of her travel situation, uh, James Hill from Housing, Neighbourhood and Building Services, uh, Jane Lama, who is going to join later at 11 for uh, an item. Uh, Francis Mullen from the City of Portsmouth College and Susanna Rosenberg, but we have Terry Russell. Yep. Um, Councillor Jason Fazakali has sent apologies for lateness. He's um, having to do with some casework. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Can I pre book my apologies as well, please? I've got a, a meeting in uh, Milton Keynes at 1.30, so it's likely that I'll have to pop off early if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so do we have any declarations of interest for today's meeting? No. Nope. Lovely, thank you. So we'll look at the minutes of the previous meeting which was held on the 9th of February. On That was our Teams meeting that we held. Does anyone have any corrections that are needed uh, on these minutes? So if we start with page one. Uh, yep. Linda, it's not a correction, it's a matter arising. Are you going to do that secondly or do you want it? Lovely. Thank you. Uh, page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. 
page 7 and page 8. Are we happy that they're an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yep. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, so now we can move on to matters arising. Councillor Jackson. Thanks. On the membership here, um, uh, from last year, we have Kirsty Miller and Jeanette Smith, um, uh, who I think we co-opted on to represent the two other political groups on the council who are not here as part of the constitution of the city council and I'd suggest that we should do likewise in this year to make sure that we are inclusive um, and therefore have somebody from the two minor parties in the city, um, Labour and the Portsmouth Independence. Thank you. I believe there's, the next item agenda is going to just discuss the Health and Wellbeing Board and Makeup. Is that correct? So we can formalise that then, Gerald, if that's okay. Fine. Thank you. Any other actions arising from, or matters arising from those papers? Uh, I don't think there were any out outstanding. No, nope. lovely. Thank you. So we'll start with the Health and Wellbeing Board and Review of Partnership. Is that over to David or Kelly? Yep, Kelly. I think I'll, I think I'll just talk to this briefly. So um, the paper just comes as part of the commitment we gave when we reviewed the Health and Wellbeing Board and brought in the Children's Trust Board and Safer Portsmouth Partnership that we would review the ways of working um, after a period of time and just check that this still feels like it's doing the job that everyone needs it to do. Um, Broadly, I think the feedback from those that we consulted was that the board does feel like it's working well and is giving the broad spectrum of issues a good airing, but that actually there's probably some um, work we need to do to make sure that some of the issues that are around specifically the children's agenda and safe reports with the agenda are getting more visibility, and that's certainly something we'll be concentrating on, and we do feel that the revised health and wellbeing strategy will be a really good vehicle for doing that as we start to get into some of the issues there, so that's something we'll take away and work on. In terms of the membership, we've reflected that there need to be some changes to that as constituted as well to reflect the changes that have moved through. That's in Section 5, and we can certainly reflect the point that Councillor Vernon Jackson made in that um, revised membership as well. The one issue that did come up in the discussions was the need for more developmental time for the board, so reflecting the fact that when the board comes together, it's generally in these quite formal agenda sessions, and we have an awful lot of business to get through, and certainly when we come into, again, looking at some of those wicked are issues that we're trying to tackle through the health and well-being strategy and of course some of the other ones that we'd raise as well there possibly isn't the time for the board to get into some of the reflection that it would want to and therefore we need to think about how we might build in some more development time for the board and maybe think about some sort of more informal sessions where we can get into some of those issues before we make recommendations in the formal arena so that's certainly something we can look to do as well so the paper comes just summarize some of those findings after a broad steer and then we'll happily take that way and bring something forward with revised terms of reference to the next meeting in order to take that forward to Governance and Audit and Standards Committee to be adopted as part of the Council's constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Jackie? I just had one, and I completely agree with all the comments that were made, including representation from all parties. I'm fully supportive of that, as well as development sessions, I think, are really important. For me, because of the changes that we're having with the... Um, Moving to the ICS, this will be my last uh, representation at the Health and Wellbeing Board because we don't have Labour um, Labour members uh, as part of the new sort of setup that's coming. So it's been a pleasure being here, but that will be part of the review of the Constitution, I imagine, or membership. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is important to have a look at that, isn't it, when we look at the membership. And thank you for your attendance at these meetings, Jackie. It has been very welcomed. We will miss you. So the paper has asked us to agree the proposed adjustments to the membership of the board as set out in section 5 and received revised constitution at the September meeting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I was just going to um, emphasise really the point made in, in paragraph 6.1 about the relationships under the new health um, and care structures. Um, and I think it is worthy of note that the health and well-being boards with the demise of the CCGs will be, you know, amongst very few statutory bodies and particularly multi-agency bodies um, within that new health and care governance structure. And I think that that is why this review is so timely 
And I think that whilst we don't know all the answers yet, because we don't know quite what the interplay is going to be between the Integrated Care Board, the Integrated Care Partnership, uh, the entity of place, which is based around uh, the upper tier local authorities, um, and indeed the health and wellbeing boards, I think it's really important that we keep alive um, to that dynamic and we make sure through this work that our health and wellbeing board is in as fit a state as it possibly can be to influence on the wider stage as well as for our own city. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No. So, uh, as we say, we're going to agree the proposed adjustments to the membership of the board as set out in Section 5 and received revised constitution at the September meeting. Everyone happy with that? N yeah. Note the need for balance across children's and community safety issues on the agenda. I think everyone would agree with that as well. Uh, agree to dedicate more developmental space to relevant matters where collaborative working will be beneficial, particularly those arising from the revised health and wellbeing strategy of 2022 to 2030. Yeah? Lovely. Thank you. So we'll move on to the Local Outbreak Engagement Board update. Thank you, Chair. So you will all remember um, that we had we, we were asked in 2020 to set up a local, uh, well, to develop a local outbreak plan and set up a local outbreak engagement board um, to run throughout the pandemic. So today I'm coming to make some recommendations about the sustainability, sustainable arrangements for local outbreak management going forward. And I'm well aware I'm saying this at a time when we are seeing increasing Sadly, numbers of uh, coronavirus cases again and, and are still expecting there to be quite a big impact in winter. But it feels timely um, to come and I've come with two recommendations today to stand down the local outbreak engagement board and in particular to note thanks to all the members for their important and valuable work in steering and assuring the uh, local pandemic response but also to recommend that we look at the health protection board which is still meeting currently but look to put it into a new format that will broaden its role um, and uh, it, therefore taking on other infectious diseases uh, and it really to help us work together as we have done very successfully for the last two years across all the partnerships across Portsmouth to ensure that we are ready uh, have plans in place to manage any infectious diseases as they come forward. And we would like to bring terms of reference to the Health and Wellbeing Board in September. So I'll just quickly um, mention a couple of things. Um, so the, oh, I do really want to ensure that we are thanking those that have been on the Local Outbreak Engagement Board, both obviously the councillors here from the council, but also the partners who have attended regularly those meetings. So over the two years of the pandemic, that board have regularly received uh, latest intelligent data relating to COVID, received reports relating to the test and trace payments, and also the test uh, and trace processes and, and systems we've had in place. Uh, prior to them being stepped down by government and obviously ensuring that we had uh, proper measures in place around contact tracing, vaccination, etc. So that uh, the board has been meeting over the last two years. So with the government making the decision to reduce restrictions um, and in line with most other local authorities, now seems to be the relevant time to actually step down the local outbreak engagement board. That does not mean, can I say, that we will step down any of the, uh, the measures that are in place that are not needed. And just to say that government, we're waiting for a further publication from government which will be the contingency framework we've had the living with covid um, program which we are working to now all of us and that's you know the nhs local government business schools partners um, but uh, we are waiting for the contingency framework which will basically uh, set out how government both nationally local government the nhs will respond if there is a need to step up uh, any uh, measures going forward, including obviously some restrictions. 
So uh, in line with that, we're going to, we're, I'm recommending to step down, change the Health Protection Board, and also we've included in the report as, as um, a, the, uh, the latest copy of the Local Outbreak Engagement Board. And just should I say we're on version 12 now, that just shows you how often government uh, uh, regulations and changes have happened. So I'll leave it there. We will bring the terms of reference for the newly formed Health Protection Board uh, in September. Thank you. Oh, Diane. Thank you. And her work has been amazing. Um, it would not be appropriate for me to sit here representing the voluntary sector without, if I hope you don't mind, uh, naming the five organisations that worked alongside Hive and the NHS to deliver food parcels. And I would really appreciate being able to name them, Chair, if that's appropriate. That's absolutely fine. Thank you kindly. Uh, the organisations were Pompey in the Community, the Salvation Army, the Citizens Advice Bureau, U Trust, and Age UK Portsmouth. And we all worked 24 7 for all of 2020, and not quite 24 7 for 2021. And we're ready to step up and support you again. Heaven help us should we need to. So thank you very much. Yeah, Thank and you. I, and as a board, again, just extend our thanks for all those organisations who did step up and support the city. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, so, again, so the recommendations were to stand down the Local Outbreak Engagement Board and thank the members uh, and to build on the relationships and learning developed in the Health Protection Board to retain the forum in a slightly different format. Uh, and are we happy with those recommendations? Yeah, and we'll see that back in September then. Thank you. Uh, health and wellbeing strategy update. Thank you, Chair. So that's me again, but I will bring in my colleagues Kelly and Matt if there are any specific questions. And I just want to again uh, acknowledge that they've done a huge amount of work on the strategy for us on the board. So I've come, the purpose of the report is to present the framework for delivery and monitoring of the health and wellbeing strategy that we agreed in February 2022. And uh, the recommendations are to note the delivery plans attached in Appendix 1 and agree the work programme. I just want to remind us, though, in terms of all of our roles within the board, so we agreed uh, in February 2022 the five priorities, which were tackling poverty, improving educational attainment, positive relationships, housing, air quality and active travel. And it's important to note that these are fairly unusual for a health and wellbeing strategy, which tends to focus on what we would call the causes of ill health and behaviours. But what we're doing here is looking at the causes of the causes. So we're really going back uh, a step. And all of these, what we'd call wider determinants of health, have an impact on all of the services that we provide and the health outcomes for our population. And I just want to remind uh, everybody that uh, we all agreed to the strategy and therefore we have got roles within the board of people who are leading both as at office level but also as champions and there's several of us in the room today. But I just want to note it is not the work of just the champions and those leading these programmes. We really all need to sign up and think about our, all our organisations as anchor institutions. I feel like I've got on my public health soapbox, do apologise but we are all anchor institutions. We are the biggest employers um, in, the, uh, in Portsmouth, and therefore everything we do in our organisations will have an impact on these, both negatively and positively, and I really want to focus on the positive impacts. So uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but Section 4 of the report details the process for taking the strategy forward now and how it will be overseen and supported by the board. Section 4.1 highlights the really important point that this strategy, which I've just uh, stressed, is a, is a new way of working for all of us and the issues do impact on all of us and all our organisations and obviously our populations. So the, I won't go through the proposed schedule, but you'll see that each of the priorities will come back in turn and the lead officers and the board sponsors will be uh, working to ensure that we've got action plans which are copied in as, at Appendix 1, that those are further developed and that, uh, uh, that we will come back and report um, at each meeting. 
and there'll be the order of how we will be reporting and I think we're doing poverty first in September and I'll leave it there thank you chair thank you any comments or questions Ma <laughs> thank you Linda and uh, thank you Helen and um, all the work that's gone on and to all our champions as well uh, who are championing all these particular areas just to sort of emphasize um, what Helen has said and the impact of this strategy um, so I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with uh, uh, about the ICS and uh, we were asked for our priorities and it was very easy for us because we've just adopted this health and well-being strategy um, and so it does mean that we have this um, we have something that isn't just for our purposes in Portsmouth but it's also um, shows about our direction of travel within the wider integrated care system and will help the, the partnership and the board at that level to understand where Ports is coming from, what our priorities are, and as Helen said, somewhat different from um, the normal uh, kind of strategy, what you would expect, because it's much more about that wider determinants of health, uh, and we know within Portsmouth that we have that real passion for, for that. So, um, so thank you for everyone who's been involved in putting this together. Obviously, I wasn't around at that particular time, so uh, it's, it's great to come here and uh, come back and see this all uh, wet, uh, all effectively ready-made. And I really look forward to, uh, to having the updates on each of those. And, uh, and as Helen said, there are the champions for each of the areas, the sponsors for each of the areas, but we have, all have that duty to, to make sure that we're tying all of this together, certainly for us myself and Gerald and, and Susie and others and the administration and I'm sure the opposition members as well um, it, it's it, doing it from a council's point of view but for all of us in all of our organisations I think that's if, if we can have this as a uh, as a basis for what we do then I think we're going to be in a really good place and, and a, a truly integrated system as, as we uh, have really championed over the years in the city Thank you oh, yeah, Jackie I can't edit anything to that. That just well said, and thank you very much for all of this work that's gone into this. Mine is a very kind of specific, I think, question that relates to the inclusion in terms of school ed and education and attainment, as well as relationship building. And as a, a young person's counsellor, one of the things I'm seeing a little bit more now, and it's a bit of a worry to me, is um, parents being threatened with fines if their children that have got acute anxiety are unable to attend school and don't hit that attendance list and it's something that we need to, I think will be just something good to look to cat and hopefully this kind of strategy will help minimize that so there isn't a punitive response to very anxious young people who would get into school if they could um, but their parents be feeling like they're being threatened if they can't get their children there it might be something to put into the pot of all knowledge we may have a response <laughs> Yeah, really happy to come in on that, Jackie. So, um, funnily enough, we were talking about it yesterday, weren't we, with uh, Councillor Horton uh, around this. There's some new national guidance around uh, attendance at school, which will come into force in September 2023, which is trying to strike that right balance between high challenge, high support. Um, but the point you're making, Jackie, is a really important one in terms of there are a number of young people uh, in the city with quite significant mental health concerns who are unable to attend school for a range of reasons. We wouldn't expect schools to go down the route of issuing fines around those children. Um, one of the bits that we're just redesigning is the pathway for support for those children through mental health support teams um, in schools, of which we've got 100% um, coverage in schools. So we were successful as a CCG in bidding for 100% uh, coverage for all of our schools. Uh, the pathway for support into MHST isn't quite where I'd like to see it in terms of those children who are what we call severe, what we called chronically absent, the government now calls severely absent children. So those attending below 50% of which there's 463 as we sit here today. Uh, who are struggling to attend school over above uh, 50%. Uh, you'll be unsurprised to know there's a huge array of issues for all of those children. There's 463 different stories as to why they're not attending school, but mental health and indeed parental mental health are major factors in that, in that severe absence. We wouldn't want to see a system whereby there's a finding mechanism for those with mental health distress, so we will be seeking to sort out those pathways to make sure that doesn't happen. 
Councillor Hall. Thank you. Um, as Hayden says, we had a long discussion about this yesterday, so it's very timely. Um, and my my challenge, in a way, to officers was about um, to maintain the high support, high challenge, because we do believe that children are better off in school. Um, but also to look at the guidance, which seems to be moving towards a bit of a one-size-fits-all for me, and that's always a bit worrying when you have legislation that moves towards that ultra standardization and actually in Portsmouth we know our families and we uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the work that we're doing around relational practice which is rolling out across the schools across the city and also um, we for example one of the things we stood up during the pandemic which was these um, link coordinators between schools and uh, children's social care and the attendance team we've made those you know we've extended that beyond the pandemic and um, and so what I don't want to lose is that individual attention to families and children in Portsmouth that we've built up. So you have my reassurance that I will, uh, will be keeping an eye on that. Councillor Norton. Uh, thank you, Chair. This ties in quite nicely with a, a request from Hampshire, really. So I sit on the Hampshire well, Health and Wellbeing Board, and one of the things that they've asked me to take to uh, yourselves, the Isle of Wight and Southampton, is um, uh, to write a letter. So they are putting children's mental health as a, a priority. I think, realistically, it's probably one of the biggest generational challenges we face. You know, the Victorians had to build schools post-war. We built hospitals. I think the impact of the internet on children's mental health is right up there with you know, some of the biggest challenges we face. And uh, Hampshire have asked if, one, if you agree that you know, children's mental health is a, a priority, and then two, with your permission chairs um, and board, if you will join them and uh, other health and wellbeing boards in writing to the ICS to, to ask what they're doing about CAMS. Now, it may be that this is kind of covered in um, this strategy, but nonetheless, it, it's a request, and I think they will, with Southampton and the Isle of Wight, be, be writing that letter. So, what's that action for you, Chair? Do you want to come in? I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'd welcome that letter. Sorry, I work for a day a week in the ICS around the, uh, developing the children's strategy. Uh, uh, mental health will absolutely be in there, there's no, no doubt about it. Um, uh, um, we're trying to kind of shift the conversation beyond how do we how do we fix, in inverted commas, CAMS into a whole system approach for mental health? Um, waiting times for CAMS across the across the Hampshire piece are uncomfortably long. Uh, Post-pandemic demand is up by somewhere in the region of 30 to 35 percent. Um, but where areas and Portsmouth are a little bit ahead of the game on this, where they've invested, where we've invested in early intervention and early help, particularly basing and around schools, that's proved to reduce demand for specialist CAM services. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure the ICS will be very pleased to receive that letter. Uh, but I'm pretty certain, as I'm writing it, uh, that mental health will absolutely be uh, a priority for children in the in the Hampshire system. Do you want to come back? Uh, absolutely. So they're drafting a letter. I don't think it's quite finished yet, but I'll make sure they forward it to you guys to, to see it yeah. before before they move forward. Absolutely. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. And is everyone happy if we support such a letter as putting children's mental health as a priority? Yeah. Oh, oh David. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I think the debate's been interesting because I think, you know, um, Helen started by explaining that, you know, our priorities, our five listed priorities, are slightly unconventional. Um, we then talked about, you know, how the strategy influences what we do and how we operate. We then got into a discussion about how the other health and well-being boards are beginning to move to try to influence um, what's likely to be happening at the ICS level. And I think it goes back to the, to the last paper in a way. And I think it just illustrates how important it is that we find the right ways of finding that influence. If we're not careful, we'll end up with the health and wellbeing board strategies from across the wider geography uh, being divided by the lowest common denominator and we'll have something that won't be meaningful to the city. Um, so I, you know, I think the, the knack is going to be how do we get the right level of influence to get the discretion that we need um, locally to target our local needs, but we have the capacity and, and the spend in order to deliver on that. And I think that's, this is part of the journey that we're going to be going on. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Thank you.
So uh, we're welcoming the strategy uh, and we look forward to having our reports at, at the schedules uh, put out. Thank you very much. Uh, over to Joe for the update on the local arrangements. Yeah, thank you. And um, this is just a very brief update of where we are with probably more information needing to come back to the board around the ch what the changes will mean um, for the Health and Wellbeing Board and, and the city in relation to the, the CCG ceasing to exist at the end of this month or next week and then the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, taking over responsibility for all the statutory functions that sat within the CCG. Um, place features very heavily in the new arrangements and the the operating model of the integrated care system. Put, and, and by place, what we're talking about is is those upper tier local authority areas, as, as we've mentioned already, um, Hampshire, Portsmouth, Southampton, and the Isle of Wight. And we are, we've just developed the constitution and governance handbook for the integrated care board. And a lot of the detail of how things will sit um, will sit in the governance handbook rather than the integrated care board constitution that's quite a significant difference from where we've been previously in the nhs where a lot of the the how you operate sits in the constitution of the ccg for example and the re but the reason it's in the handbook is quite positive because actually it gives us a much easier opportunity to change and flex things as we move forward um, because otherwise if it's in the constitution and you want to change something you have to go all the way up to NHS England to change it but whereas actually most of the working sits in the, the handbook and around the scheme of reservation and delegation so that does give us that opportunity to continue to flex and change as things develop moving forward, which picking up on David's point, how do we influence? I think it's important for people to understand that difference so that things aren't set in stone from the 1st of July onwards. Um, and all of these are, are drafts. Some of the, we're also expecting more guidance to come down nationally as well around some of these things. Again, testing how things work. But the, the aim of the ICB and very much the message from NHS England has been that a huge amount of it is up for local local places, local systems to determine how they operate and to have that autonomy to operate. Um, so, so that's all, all kind of being developed. What we've, where we currently are, is we've got a draft um, structure. One, one of the sort of structures for the Integrated Care Board delivery. Um, executive if you like so it sits under the executive director of delivery um, and a structure that looks at how we will manage um, places within that and at the moment we're looking at place directors for each of those four places um, they're NHS roles but again there's opportunities to really look at how we develop that place-based leadership as we move forward and obviously the model we have in Portsmouth is quite a, a shared integrated um, leadership model around place using the section 75s and myself Helen David Sarah, myself Helen Andy and Hay and Sarah Hayden all working under David as that sort of um, chief of health and care Portsmouth so that will continue those section 113 agreements will continue um, and again there's opportunities for us to think about how that will develop as we move forward um, from the NHS side as I say this structure is out for engagement with all partners across the ICS lots of people have fed into that um, and commented and it also looks at the clinical a clinical director and lead nurse for place as well um, so again to support that leadership team but we we haven't quite worked through all of that so we're still looking at what that will mean from a finance perspective for example and some of our other teams um, so that that's where we are the what we've also been looking at and working with other areas around is the section 75 arrangements and the place-based governance arrangements that will support that so currently we have joint commissioning board um, that's a, a, a committee of the CCG board um, and council officers attend in there um, with their own sort of delegation and responsibility in relation to their role 
We suspect that will continue under the Integrated Care Board. We're just looking through the terms of reference um, for what that will mean. There is an option for that to become a truly joint committee, but again, from a local authority perspective, we need to understand what that means because it's, it's looked at from an NHS perspective rather than perhaps fully understanding what it means from a joint um, a local authority. So lots of, again, more guidance will come down nationally, but also a really good opportunity for us to shape and think about how we want that to work as we move forward. Um, it's likely that the name of the Joint Commissioning Board will change to a partnership a place-based partnership board, so Health and Care Portsmouth Partnership Board. Um, the other work that we've been doing, again, to make sure we're in a good place for transition is all the work we've shared with the board previously around the Section 75, so updating um, all of our existing agreements into a single framework, and now we're looking at how we continue to extend and increase those with the aim that all of that place-based integrated pooled fund arrangements will sit within that place-based partnership board or, or joint commissioning board however we we want to call it moving forward and that has all provided all partners on it so um solent nhs trust um portsmouth primary care alliance and portsmouth hospitals trust are represented and also um the hive portsmouth so again we can have that really inclusive discussion around how we spend the money with place for the money that sits outside of the pooled funds, the expectation is at the moment some of that will sit with the place director as a as a commissioning lead and continue to have that accountability and oversight of the budgets. I suspect that will change as we move forward, but that, that's where we will start from. Um, so this is really just to give an update on where we are. Um, and we'll probably need to bring more bits back as things develop. The The main focus for us, I think, at the moment is now that we've got the Section 75 schedule and um, overarching framework, is really working through what the plans and objectives are that sit within each of those schedules and, the, and there's sort of five schedules, but also how that feeds back into the refreshed blueprint that we've done some work in this group around over the last year and the Health and Wellbeing Board. So we've got a really clear suite of priorities that sit under the Health and Wellbeing Strategy around the delivery and improvement of access to health and care in the city. So that's all. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Jackie? I know you've talked about it in brief before, I think, Joe, and I guess bottom line for me might be around how confident we are that we get the delegation that we need to undertake the work that we get. And you may not be able to give, to give an answer now, but I guess it was worth airing that that might be an area to look at. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think these are these are some of the issues that we're, we're all grappling with. Um, and we're, we're, it's still very live conversations around what will the new um, standing financial instructions look like for the ICB um, and what what does that delegation really mean? I think the, the important thing for us and where we're trying to think through the scenarios of where it works now but where it might not work in the future if we don't get it right initially is around how we make decisions together in the room and that's something we've been really good at um as painful as it might be on occasions isn't it andy but really having the the open discussion and being able to make the financial decisions together has got us further than perhaps we would have got otherwise and we've got some really good examples of where we can share the pain of that we've gone through in that around particularly some of our D2A discussions and there'll be others in children. So what we're trying to do is take those practical examples and say where there are really different difficult decisions to make and where we have to have that flexibility to move money and reconfigure services, we need to be doing that together. This is how we've done it. Is that are we still going to be able to do that in the new arrangements? And and if not then then how will how will it work and what will the unintended consequences be? I think we are probably further ahead in the way we've worked in partnership in the city. So there is something about people catching up and and understanding they can't quite see, not everyone can see where how how it works and where it might not work. So they're less sighted on some of those unintended consequences than perhaps we are. So we're trying to 
continue to work with them and share those practical examples of how how we what we need to retain moving forward and how we have that that streamlined decision making as we move forward so i'm i'm really confident that we'll we'll get there it's just how we make that progress as we move forward thank you Diane. thank you chair yeah joe a demonstration of partnership which has been fabulous is the involvement of the voluntary sector in all these discussions and the, the understanding from different areas where we've been meeting across Hampshire and Isle of Wight and Southampton is, is quite extraordinary and there were some very educational <laughs> meetings as to what can and can't happen and true understanding of, of the, the remit of, of the national health and what we all expect versus the ground floor experience of, of the voluntary sector. But it, it's been fabulous discussions, really interesting work streams, very constructive, and it's all been taken and received. And I believe we might hear something in July as to our voluntary sector proposals for our representation in either the board or the partnership. So we will find excellent. out shortly. So oh, thank excellent. you very much. Yeah. It, it was hugely inclusive. Yeah, no, that's really good news, Diane. And I think I think it is about as we all learn together how we can come together in new ways and and share share the best bits of what's going on and, and move forward from there. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Winton. Thanks, and uh, thanks for the report on this. It's really uh, it's really helpful um, and just sort of just show that we're trying our very best to. Um, to carry on with our integration as much as possible under the new structures. Um, just to sort of follow up on, on Joe's point, um, I think that um, let's not forget that it's called an integrated care system and we have lots of integration here. So technically what, we, what we're doing in Portsmouth is how we were supposed to do things. So this could be, if, if all this work that's going on and I was talking to Joe yesterday, who uh, you know will be glad when she never sees another Section 75 agreement. I think, um, uh, but but all that work is worth it because it can be a real template for the rest of Hampshire Isle of Wight integrated care system into how to do integration, how to work together, um, and so there is risk, and there always is risk with these kind of things. But there's also huge amounts of opportunity because. If we get this right and we can show this is a real way of how how you integrate, then that can be a model that others can say, yeah, actually this is what we should be doing, and and the one thing that the uh, as as Joe has just said as well is that for those other areas who are not necessarily sure how they're going to move forward, what integration really means, and of course, let's be honest, what the um, what the government's going to be looking down and saying. Well, are you integrating whatever? If we've got this model here and all the work that's been going on, not just in the last few months, but also for years and years in our integration, then um, it puts us in a really good place to be able to do, um, to carry on doing what we're doing and to try and influence as well good ways of working right across the ICS area. Um, and, and, and from what David was saying earlier, about how we can influence this is certainly one way we can influence because if we're well ahead of the game on this then others will be saying how have you done this so um so thank you joe for all of your work on this and to every, again to everyone else who's been involved but this is a really important bit of work and and um and, and i think stands in really good stead um and just thank you to everyone here and beyond for all the work on integration that you've all been doing over the years Thank you. And um, we look forward to more updates as they come. And I think it's, it is important, isn't it? We have the relationships both here in the city, but with our colleagues across the ICB to make this work. And so you know, hopefully we'll build on that moving forward. Could be quite exciting times. Um, over to Community Safety Annual Report. Lisa. Oh, I'd just like to introduce it, if yeah, that's lovely. okay. No Thank problem. you, Chair. So um, in, in 
uh, line with everybody else this morning, I'd like to start by thanking the key contributors to this progress report. Um, Alan Noble, Bruce Marr, Caroline Hopper, Lisa and Sam Graves in particular, who pulls all of the data together from a variety of sources. Um, it is a long report. I hope you've had time to read it, and particularly in respect of those elements that might be um, relating to your own business areas. Um, so Lisa's going to take us a few so through some of the key points in just a minute, um, but as the report suggests, I agree that we need to roll forward the current priorities until 2023. Um, and the reason for that is that whilst we've um, seen reductions in some recorded crime, we've also seen increases in other areas such as serious sexual off offences. And what we just don't know is coming out of the pandemic where we really stand. So we've already got back to existing crime levels, starting to see increases beyond pre-pandemic levels. So I think we really need to wait for it to settle so that we can start to understand what our crime picture in the city looks like. There are some encouraging areas, so you'll see a reduction in most serious violence and violence with injury. And also the way in which we report and record our crime has changed, which does sometimes inflate the figures because where we might have recorded a crime as one incident previously, we're now in line with Home Office counting rules recording maybe two or three against one incident um, with different crime types involved in it. So it's quite complex and we just don't know what the new normal looks like at the moment. So um, there's also been changes to legislation, new Domestic Abuse Act and new serious violence duties on the horizon, the Police and Crime Sentencing Bill, so that's all to come as well. And of course we also need to make sure that the plan um, supports the city vision. So I'll hand over to Lisa and she can just pull out some of those key points for consideration for you. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, it is a very long report, but there is a lot of work going on. I think that's what it reflects, really. It reflects also the spread of the work across the organisation and across partners now, whereas it used to be contained within one directorate. It's now much more mainstreamed across the organisation. And the report, as Claire says, is a real team effort. So, you know, there's a lot of cutting and pasting going on. Um, when I was preparing this report. So just to run swiftly through the, um, the priorities. So priority A, which is around violence and reducing violence. Um, one of the key things that we've done over the last 12 months is to develop the domestic abuse um, performance framework um, to really understand how we're performing around uh, supporting people uh, who experience domestic abuse and holding perpetrators to account. And that, there's a, that all that information there has come directly from Sam's report, um, which comes to the, the domestic abuse strategy group, the new domestic abuse strategy group that sits under this group. Um, and you can see that there's some really, um, there's some, it's sort of amber, I think at the moment there's some very good stuff, but there's some stuff that's a bit stuck around perpetrators that we need to, uh, to get to grips with. Um, the data also shows that of those people who are accessing the services and engaging with the services, um, that we are managing to reduce their risk, which is one of the key um, things that we're trying to do. Um, Claire mentioned the new serious violence duty coming around the corner. I'm not going to go into details about what that entails. Um, I think I've uh, referenced it in the report, but what it is basically saying is that we need to work together as partners to reduce serious violence, which we do already. So um, it's not going to have a huge impact, I don't think, or we don't think, on the way that we do things in Portsmouth. Um, so uh, priority B, substance misuse. Alan's done a huge amount of work bringing in um, lots of um, different funding streams to the, uh, to the city over the last 12 to 18 months. We've now got a dedicated rough sleeper team, a new drug and alcohol uh, treatment contract, and uh, I don't know, Alan's now developing a new um, drug strategy for the city um, in the light of the um, Carol Black report, which is bringing further funding into the city but it's very uh, controlled in the way that it needs to be spent. Um, Alan's also part of our um, Changing Futures group which is working, we're continuing to work on um, improving the outcomes for people with co-occurring medical conditions and complex needs. Um, priority C, now this, this is all about early intervention and early identification um, in order to reduce 
violence and antisocial behaviour down the line. These are long-term strategic priorities. They're not sort of um, operational ones. Um, and most, if not all, of this work is delivered by children's services now. Um, so Hayden uh, and Kelly and Matt and myself work you know, quite closely on, on pulling those things together. Um, the Violence Reduction Unit that has been funded by the um, Home Office and the Police and Crime Commissioner was embedded in children's services. So we focused, we didn't create a whole new structure around it. We embedded it in the structures that we already had and focused on maximising the um, uh, funding towards frontline services. Um, and there have been some really good um, uh, developments on that. We've seen a, a reduction in uh, the number of young people at risk of child sexual exploitation um, and a reduction in the number of um, people going into A&E for drug and alcohol related issues. Um, so there's more in the report obviously but I'm not going to go through the detail. Um, and Claire's explained the new normal um, and it's very difficult to, to, to judge, as she said, because of changes in, in recording practices and also just the impact on all the data sets that we use, not just the police data, but all the data sets that we use for the strategic assessment. Um, when it was approved last year, there were two further uh, priorities which I've noted. One was about um, accessing mental health uh, services, and I know the, there's a, a a, a national program going on around improving mental health services that locally is referred to as No Wrong Door and um, that is that there were some recent um, workshops in Portsmouth um, where lots of information is being pulled in together. Now very similar I must say to some of the stuff that we've done around complex needs so it's reassuring that actually that's the same messages that are coming through um, so that's sort of work that's happening over there so we don't need to replicate that and the other thing was about around cybercrime. There seems to be a shift um, in terms of uh, crime types towards online crime. Um, and of course that's not just a Portsmouth issue, that's a national issue. Um, and we've got the online safety bill um, coming through on that as well. So we'll be watching the impact of that. But we'll also be updating the um, community safety website uh, to make sure people are aware of the things that they can do to keep themselves safe online and what to do if they feel as if their um, privacy has been breached. Um, so that's that's really it. I don't know. I'm very happy to answer any questions about on this long report, um, if you've got any. Um, but I think the final thing is that we need to be aware of is, and Councillor Norton's gone, unfortunately. I was going to ask him if he had any more up-to-date information. Eh? Money. Money, yes. <laughs> um, uh, on the review, there's a, bit, a national review um, about on the role of police and crime commissioners and one of the things that's come out of that is a, a need for a robust review of community safety partnerships. Now what that entails, I don't know, because there's no more detail about it at the moment, but I was hoping he might be able to throw some light on that. But uh, anyway, that's, um, that's me. Thanks. Thank you. And yeah, a long report, but very interesting reading. And you know, great to see all this work going on in the city. So commend the team on that. Uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, Claire? Yeah, just one final comment from me. I think another um, highlight of the report is the community safety survey that's taken place. Um, and we should really acknowledge that because I, I know that there's a lot of crime within the city that goes unreported. So that survey of stakeholders and residents is really important to us to get a feel for it. And the fact that um, there's already been 1,200 face-to-face -face surveys completed, I think should be commended. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that, that the report, the final report for that survey is actually being done now, being proofread now. So it will be available to be circulated to this, uh, to this um, board um, very shortly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No, so we're asked to accept the report and also to accept the recommendation that the priorities are rolled forward to 2023, as just discussed. Is everyone happy for that? Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so item agenda, agenda item nine, we've been asked to delay that until the next meeting because unfortunately um, we cannot present that today uh, due to illness. So we're going to move on to the policing race action plan, Claire, if that's okay. 
Yes, thank you, and timely, because I know I'm just about to get a call in seven minutes, so this won't take long. <laughs> um, so the reason why I'm bringing this, the National Race Action Plan, to the Health and Wellbeing Board is because I think disproportionality is something that affects us across the city in terms of all of our service delivery and something that we all need to take into account. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes explaining what's happening within policing, but I think it's part of that broader discussion. Um, and we know through COVID that there's been sections of the community disproportionate affected with their health outcomes um, and we look obviously very closely at what's happening within criminal justice and uh, disproportionality whether that be um, ethnicity which is what we're focusing on here but obviously there are other elements for us around disproportionality looked after children you know maybe being one of those that I would bring to the surface there so um, so we have uh, the National Police Chiefs Council and the College of Policing have launched the National Race Action Plan um, it starts really with a statement of intent that we're asking all of our staff to sign up to and that's about being proactive, um, understanding um, whether there is racism in policing, um, being honest and in the, our assessment of that and uh, facing our unconscious bias that we may be experiencing within policing and being proactive to find out more about communities and cultures. There's a survey that's been running um, that just tests officers' knowledge and confidence um, so that we know how we can start to tackle our um, our improvement plan. The chief constables written out to all chief executives um, and that's coordinated by one of our assistant chief constables. So what we're, what we're doing in terms of delivery for our frontline staff, we've been rolling out our inclusion matters training which is a one day course um, really useful in tackling some of those biases and, and just getting people to talk openly um, around their own experiences within policing as well because of course we need to look internally at our workforce and that sense of belonging that they have to the organisation, um, particularly important for us because we've got lots of new student officers. So I'm working with Portsmouth University to look at um, that real sense of belonging when they arrive with a team, how that works, and if we're not retaining staff, why that is, and really delving into that with some in-depth sort of face-to-face -face interviews so that we understand. So we're um, continuing a positive action campaign to attract and retain a more diverse workforce and certainly with our last student uptake that was successful in terms of the diversity that we had into the organisation in terms of ethnicity far greater than we've ever had before so that was really encouraging. Um, we're going to increase our focus on recording, analysing and scrutiny of police powers and we have a strategic independent advisory group and within every district we have independent advisors who sit and they will look at our stop and search processes, they'll view our body worn video, they um, will look at domestic abuse incidents, hate crime incidents and they will really be challenging around police practices and our use of powers and whether that's been proportionate or not. Um, we know we are disproportionate in terms of conducting um, pace strip searches um, on children in particular. So you will be, I'm sure, acutely aware of the um, the situation in the Met with the school child. Um, that has caused all of us across the country to look at our data in respect of that. And if you'd asked me prior to looking at the data, I would have said that that wasn't an issue in Hampshire, but it absolutely is. And some of that may be because police officers record accurately when they are undertaking stop and search powers with different ethnic groups and less likely to actually record that correctly when they're searching white um, British um, people for instance uh, but nevertheless we have a we have a problem with that and we need to be honest with ourselves about it so we've immediately put some plans in place around changing the authority levels um, around strip searches of children so they would all come to me now as a superintendent and and in my role today as call out. Um, that's something that would have to come to me for authority and if I'm being really honest I'd have to think really long and hard about whether we've got grounds to strip search. It would be very few cases that I would be authorising that. Um, so we're looking at that and then of course that recording of the stop checks to become mandatory um, and some of that is down to our systems. I'm sure we're all in the same situation. I wish we had systems like Amazon where you actually couldn't complete something unless you've ticked every box but we're not quite there so we're working on that so that we can then start to really record accurately what it is that we're achieving. So I just wanted to, to bring it to the board today just to really as a discussion point and, and I guess to consider whether disproportionality is something that we feel that we should focus on as a board throughout the, all of those key areas that we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions? David? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think this is a really important um, issue, and I think that the insight that we can get through Claire and her colleagues in the police um, will be of benefit to all of the agencies um, across the city. And we, we do have a network um, around uh, diversity, inequality, and disproportionality. And I think it would be, you know, whilst not everything is going to be directly transferable, I think, you know, as, as Claire said, some of the, the sort of shocks of expectation um, are really telling. Um, and I think it's incumbent on all of our agencies uh, to make sure that we're exploring this, analysing it, and then you know looking to tackle it. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from one another in terms of how we approach that. Thank you, Jackie. And I, I would say the same. I just wholly welcome this. I really do, and I just love the approach of transparency and honesty, and, and typical of Portsmouth to face the challenges and do it appropriately and do it well and congruently. I think, uh, yeah, fair play. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Diane. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think this is amazing. And I think yes, as Jackie just said. Typical of Portsmouth, I sit on um, a Hampshire police networking group for voluntary sector organisations and my deep frustration is the entire representative is middle class white and I have supplied lists of organisations from Portsmouth because as Jackie said I do think we take the lead on a lot of this but there's something we're doing wrong because they won't join us and I find that really really frustrating and please note my wording it's something we're doing wrong in our presentation or it's an experience or something that's happened that has created that distance and I think the more transparent we are and, and continuing to be transparent is is paramount to breaking down those barriers so I think this is absolutely vital and I'm delighted thank you thank you Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll be moving on to the multiply funding paper, and it's for Jane. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Um, just a brief report um, and to give you um, a little bit of context to it. Um, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is a funding stream that has replaced uh, European social funding and comes direct into the city as a unitary authority. Um, We've actually received 1.4 million over a three-year period um, that we're working on separately. Alongside it is a new funding stream called Multiply, which is one of the first priorities. Uh, as a first priority of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, it's slightly different. It's delivered by DfE, but in real terms, what it means to the city is just over 1 million to use to support adults who are 19 plus and have failed to yet achieve maths at level two. So that would be your normal GCSE level four or grade C in old language. But it's offering us real innovation in the way that we can respond to that. So we've been doing some significant work because these are working on very tight timescales to create an investment plan. This investment plan for Multiply needs to go back to government at the end of this month. Um, we actually have to have it improved early next week, and that's in David's diary. Um, but it works across 10 core principles of, of um, interventions, which include focusing on parents, include focusing on adults who are already in work, adults who are seeking work, those who are ex-offenders or just leaving or under just leaving custodial sentences, um, as well as opportunities to do things very differently in a hope that we'll overcome the barriers um, to maths because we know that across the UK but particularly in the city we have underachievement that proves a barrier to employment. It's a very flexible fund we have to we will take a commissioning basis with it so once we have submitted the investment plan and had it improved in the autumn we're not quite clear what autumn means in real terms we'll then have released to spend the first money which we'll do on a commissioning basis working with partners and we've na named the various partners that we've sort of engaged with our aim at this point is to identify where we want to balance the money out um, in the hope that we'll be able to spend this in a really positive way across the city to do something a little bit different thank you 
Any comments or questions? I think any money into the city that will improve education for our residents is but warmly welcome. So I look forward to seeing what you do do with it. Is there a plan to bring back what's, what's been done for the city? Uh, yeah, we certainly can. It would be interesting to see. Thank you. No problem at all. Thank you. So that actually brings us to the end of our formal agenda, I believe. Am I wrong, Kelly? Uh, no, no, that is right. We obviously deferred on the item. So, yeah, nothing else to cover today. Lovely. And I see the dates for the future meetings are for next year, but of course we have one in September this year still to have, don't we? So that should already be in your diaries, but the future ones have been set for 2023. If there are any problems with the dates, could you let us know as soon as possible so we can look at that? Well, thank you for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.